Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, my name is Carrie Damon. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Education here at Mars. And uh, um, welcome to the final stretch of Entrepreneurship 101, where we start talking about money. So we've got tonight, we've got a lecture on bootstrapping. And the following uh, two or three sessions, we'll be talking about um, v venture capital. We're having a, a venture capitalist panel. And we'll be talking about terms of investments, what it looks like if you get an agreement with venture capitalists and uh, going into talking about the pitch. So how do you pitch to investors? So this is a really, really important part of Entrepreneurship 101. We save it for the last because we hope that you'll be engaged when we start talking about money. Um, I'm really, really delighted to introduce Charles Plant today. I have, uh, I actually don't know where to begin introducing him. He um, isn't, has been a serial entrepreneur over the course of his career, but he's also at different points worked for Mars. And he's actually the genesis um, behind the Mars Media, so these videos, th that was something that he created, as well as our Entrepreneur's Toolkit, uh, which are our online resources. So he's very passionate about education, about supporting entrepreneurs, having entrepreneurs teach entrepreneurship. So we're, we're always great, happy, but we did leave Mars and start his own company, um, so we're always happy to have him back. So a little bit about his, his background, he's currently the, the founder and chairman of Material Minds. He founded this management training company because he'd run into one too many managers who were overworked, overwhelmed, and armed with little management training. In his career that has been, been over about 30 years, he's coached over 1,000 managers. He spent four years at Mars, leading a group of former entrepreneurs and specialists who provided education, mentorship, market intelligence, and capital to over 2,000 technology startups. I forgot that you created the uh, market intelligence team as well. Prior to Mars, Charles spent 15 years as co-founder and CEO of Synamics, a telecommunications software firm that provided mass calling platforms to telcos. Additionally, he has taught at York's Schulich School of Business. I actually met Charles uh, when I did my MBA at Schulich, and he was a management accounting professor, which he doesn't like um, to have people know that because he's such a creative entrepreneur and he sort of hates the numbers. But um, I think you'll see knowing the numbers and having the creative side um, and, and a passion for things is sort of a triple whammy that he brings to entrepreneurship. So if you're impressed with what you hear from him tonight, um, we're delighted that he's agreed to also do a best practices session on April 26th. Um, he'll be talking about seven things you need to know about management. Uh, Charles taught our team and indeed some, the organization of, of Mars a lot of great management techniques and really helped um, what was a startup itself and growing very rapidly, um, how to put in places and how to really manage our growth. So I think um, you'll really learn a lot from his best practices session and I encourage you to attend that. Without further ado, welcome Charles. Oh my God, that's such a building to live up to except for the fact that you now know I have been an accountant in my life, and therefore your level of anticipation drops significantly, I, I expect, as a result of that. Um, amongst other things, I wrote a book in uh, last spring, and I sent it around to publishers. It hasn't been published yet, don't worry. You don't have to read it, and I'm not here selling it. Uh, I, I was told that the book was dry and dense. And my response was, well, I'm dry and dense, and people like me need something to read. So those of you... Who here is actually has started a business? Oh my God. Okay, that's amazing. How, who's anticipating starting? And who's here just for the entertainment value? Okay, the, the third group can leave now because there is no entertainment value to what we're doing tonight. Um, I love talking about bootstrapping. For many years, I talked about getting VC funding. And um, the first business, which I was in for 15 years, I had the misfortune to actually get VC funding. And uh, from a number of VCs in both Canada and the US in uh, the above $10 million range, got lots of money, very nice. But I vowed when I left that business, I would never get another cent of VC money. And so the business that I'm doing now, and that what I've always said about my next business, I said I had to have three things. Number one, I had to have domain expertise in the area. Uh, number two, it had to be recurring revenue. And number three, it couldn't require any VC funding. So bootstrapping, when you don't require VC funding, is the only way to go. So it is something I'm a little passionate about. And you'll excuse me if I try and convince you that it is really the only way to go. 
So what do these companies have in common here? Coca-Cola, sorry? App, uh, what's that? That's Microsoft. I don't rec, oh no, that's Apple. Uh, HP, Dell, Clorox, Microsoft, what do they have in common? They're all bootstrapped. The brand. Right? They were all bootstrapped. Every single one of those companies was bootstrapped. You probably don't realize it. You probably don't realize Apple is one of the best bootstrapping stories in the history of business. Not only is it the best story in the history of business, it is the best bootstrapping story in the history of business, and people don't get that. You know, you've got to go back to the founding of Apple to understand this. And you'll excuse me if I get my notes, because I always try and get things right. If I can't, I just invent things. Um, <laughs> Wozniak uh, was, was writing code for um, the new chip and showed it off at the Homebrew Computing Club where it gained the attention of Jobs who thought, well, you know, I can probably sell a few of these things. Now, this was 1976, okay? And so Jobs went out to try and sell the concept that Wozniak had actually created. Anybody know this story? You know that you know that you can correct me then when I when I get it wrong. Thank you very much. Um, so, in, in he went to a, a retail store in the area and said, "Look, we can create these computers for you. Why don't you buy some?" And the guy said, "Well, okay, I'll take 50 of them." So at this point in time, they designed a product, they'd created the product, they'd sold 50 of them, but of course they had no inventory and they couldn't make 50. So he went to the chip suppliers and all of those people and said, "Look, I've got an order here for 50 computers." I can sell them and collect if you'll give me 60-day terms. So, you know, the supplier scratched his head and said, um, you know, okay, we'll give you the terms, go make the computer. So they made the computer, they sold the computer, it was the Apple I. Anybody here have a Mac? So you're part of the, part of the history of Mac. Um, they created the company on April 1st, 1976 very convenient that it was April Fool's Day. They created the product before they created the company. Now that's the reverse of what most people do nowadays. They create a company and then a product. So they created a product and then a company. Um, they, sorry, they created a company, but they didn't incorporate until January 3rd, 1977. And you're thinking, okay, so what did they do? When did they first raise any money? It wasn't actually until 1978. They had product, they had sales, they got customers, they had revenue, they had costs, and their first funding in 1977 was 250000 They raised 518078 little amounts, not big amounts, $2.3 million in 1980 and went public in 1980. So it's a classic tale of a bootstrapper. There is one more point to that bootstrapping story that's interesting, is that their first venture failed. They, uh, does anybody know what phone freaking is? Have you done that? No. Phone freaking is where you imitate the long distance tones to get free long distance calling in a telephone. So they actually created boxes that imitated the long distance tone and were selling them to friends and all sorts of people and making free long distance calls around the world as a result of it. Earned their first money doing that and that was their first business. They decided that it was a little dicey because it was highly illegal, and so didn't stay in that business. But that's their first part of bootstrapping. So you've heard of bootstrapping, haven't you? So a simple definition of bootstrapping is that it's starting a company without, investing, without investment money, without getting money from angels, without getting money from friends, without getting money from relatives, without uh, getting money from VCs. Bootstrapping is starting it with your own resources. In a partnership, it's using the other resources from other people that does not involve giving away equity. So when I started Synamics, which Carrie alluded to, I made all the mistakes because I went to school and unfortunately had too much education and the education said, well, the first thing you do when you start a company is you go get uh, investment from friends and relatives. And after that, you go and get investments from angels and then you go get money from VCs. So I did that. Immediately, immediately on starting the company. And it was pretty easy. I got money from friends and relatives. I got it from angels and I got it from VCs over the space of a couple of years to start the business up. 
and then scratched my head and said, what have I done? Why have I done this? It doesn't make sense. I've, I've wasted my money. Later on, I made the mistake of going back and getting more VC money. But the key to bootstrapping is that you can believe you can start a business for less than 10,000 bucks. In fact, Inc. Magazine runs a great article every year on how to start businesses for less than $10,000. Most of the companies on the Inc. 500 were started for less than $10,000. So bootstrapping is that art. It is possible. Now, why would you want to? You know, if somebody's going to give you money, why wouldn't you take the money? Make sense? If it's easy to get, why not get it? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first is that if you think it's easy, it's actually not going to be very easy. You might be able to get it, but it's going to take a lot of time. And if you're a sole founder and you set out to get VC money, it might take you 9 to 12 months to get money. And you're going to spend most of your time working for 9 to 12 months on raising the money. If you're raising the money, what aren't you doing? And you're not building your business. You're building your, you're building your equity instead of building your business. You're not building product. You're not building sales. So let's say you actually have a few people that you're working with. Even if you do have three or four people, if one of you is out gain, raising money, that's somebody that's taken away in the beginning from the business. Second reason that you might not want to is that the minute you've got money, who do you think's in control? You might, sometimes you think, oh, that's going to be okay, you know, they don't know what they're doing, and so they'll just leave us to do their thing. No, that's not the case. Unless you get lots of money from relatives who are easy to con, then, uh, not that your relatives are any easier to con than mine were, but um, unless you get that type of money, you're going to have people who are going to exert some control. They're going to demand to approve the business plan on an annual basis. They're going to have an agenda that is necessarily and probably different from your agenda. Now, why are you entering business? Is it to get wealthy? Well, we got a yes. Why else would you want to enter, start a business? You want control? You want independence? You want creativity? You want a return for your effort? What don't you get when you get an investor in? You don't get control. You can have creativity, but you don't get independence. You can't take two months off if you decide you want to. So that's the second factor. The third factor is, are you any good at what you do? Yeah? What do you want to share? Why do you want to share with somebody else if you're any good? If you can create it, why would you want to share it? There are lots of reasons why you might not want to, be, to uh, uh, get investment money. One of the biggest ones is people's misconception as to what actually are the results of business startups. And I've, I've heard a figure, and uh, the figure is that only 2% of businesses that are started actually get external money. That means 98% of businesses that are started actually are started by bootstrapping. And of those 2%, let's say that one half of those actually get VC money. What percentage of those actually succeed? Maybe 20% of the VC-backed companies actually succeed. So if you're starting a business and expect to be successful with VC money, 0.2%, you have a 0.2% chance of success. Does that make sense? Also, people's perceptions of how fast businesses grow is, is often skewed. If you look at this chart, it's a funny looking chart. But what each of those lines is, is one company, and it's, and it's revenue growth rate. So it's showing what amount of revenue it got to and how many years it took to get there. Now, I think this is the software industry. I can't remember because I've been using the slides for so long and didn't put notes with it. But if you'll notice, this is the 50 best companies ever created in the software business a couple of years ago. 50 best companies. The 50th best company took... 30 years to get beyond 50 million. So if you can imagine how many companies are started every year, and that's all sorts of starts, the chance of being in that group is so slim that it's almost ridiculous. It is so uh, preposterous that betting on it is, is just not worth the effort. That's another reason you want to bootstrap, because in all likelihood, you'll be able to create an excellent business 
if you're bootstrapping, but if you're going with VC money, you're going to create something that's entirely different and might flame out just because you're getting investment. There's a funny thing uh, that's happened. In Canada, um, if we get to look at some facts about VCs, the average rate of return over the last 20 years for VCs has been negative. You've heard there's no VC money around? Well, that's why there's no VC running around, money around. Randall Howard wrote a blog recently on this, why VCs didn't work, and I'm interesting having a debate with him on some of the factors on this. But a negative rate of return from the most intelligent venture capital investors in the country. So if you are successful with a venture capitalist, what's your rate of return going to be in all likelihood? Negative. Yeah. Why would you want to go into a system in which the average rate of return is negative? Where your likelihood of getting the funding is 1% and where, you're, where the expected value of that is a negative return. You know, I, I did teach something about this at one point in time and if you multiply those two things together, your expected rate and the, you know, all of that stuff, what you get is a negative number. So your chances of succeeding with venture capital money um, and getting a return is just not there. Now, oddly enough, I know lots of entrepreneurs. I, you know, entrepreneurs seem to know each other because no one else will put up with us. So you might laugh, but it's absolutely correct. An entrepreneur is someone who can hold down no discernible job or something like that. There's a definition I've been looking for. Um, I know tons of entrepreneurs, and I know tons of really wealthy entrepreneurs. Not one of the wealthy entrepreneurs that I know personally was backed by a VC. Every one of them bootstrapped. That was another reason when I set out to start another business where I said, I'm not going to do it the old way. I'm going to bootstrap it because it's just not worth the effort. The rate of return isn't there. And the friends that have done it have all done it them without outside capital. Research in motion isn't doing very well nowadays, right? It's, it's a sad story. You know, they stepped away probably from the corporate game to the enterprise game to the consumer game, and nobody beats uh, Apple at the consumer game. So, you know, it's, it's a sad story. But their story is great in, in a number of regards. The first is, uh, RIM was pretty well bootstrapped. And you get the idea that RIM came of age in the late 90s. But it was actually started 15 years before that, in 1984. People here know this story of, of RIM? Didn't know that? He knew everything about Apple, but he didn't know anything about RIM. That's not very Canadian of you, I must admit. <laughs> there, there, nobody's written a book on RIM, and if they did now, it probably wouldn't sell very well. But um, <laughs> RIM was started in 84, and I, I ran into RIM a few times in the 80s because I started Cynamics in the 80s as well. We both got funding from one interesting program, Innovation Ontario Corporation, whose successor is now the Investment Accelerator Fund, which is run upstairs at Mars. So there were, there were a whole bunch of companies around that time. Open Text was another one that got funding through that source. So that was pretty well all of the external investment. RIM just kept going, kept going, kept trying products, kept doing things. If you looked at that chart later, I mean, 30 years? No, 15 years, RIM got to 15 million. It did that all of a sudden, and that's possible. But if you get VC money in your second year, what do you think you've got left of the company by the 15th year? You've got nothing. You're not even working there. Balsilli and Lazaridis would not have been working at RIM when it went public in 1998 or whatever that year was if they'd gotten VC money back in the 80s. There's no way. The VCs would have been under, out of the picture because they wouldn't have received a return on their investment. They wouldn't have been able to get subsequent rounds. They would have gone down rounds, which are what happens when you sell it $2 one time and $1 the next time. It's called a down round. And the founders would have been squeezed out, left with nothing, and somebody later would have done well. There is a company that did that in the United States. It wasn't, didn't take 15 years. I think it was Citrix, where it had so much money in it over a period of time that the, it just kept diluting and diluting out the investors until it was almost worthless, except for the fact that Citrix did so enormously well when it went public that they did get some money. But I frequently talk to founders of businesses who, um, in fact, the creator of this program, Entrepreneurship 101, 
who was a founder of a business, uh, said that by the time it got to the third round of venture capital, she had less than 1% of her business. Well, less than 1%. That's another factor in what happens with uh, VC money that's too early. So have I scared you yet? Have I convinced you? Unfortunately, I speak first, and the VCs get to speak next. And they're going to tell you a wonderful story about how they're going to work together with you and make all sorts of money. Well, the fact is they're going to make all sorts of money because they get paid by a, a percentage management expense ratio that's abnormal. And they, they earn their money theoretically through carry. But the richest VCs in Canada were the owners of Vengrowth. And the owners of Vengrowth never earned a return for their shareholders. If you'd like to see that, it's public, public information. And the owners of the, who did the, the VCs that did the managing earned two to four million dollars a year. Their investors didn't earn anything. That's personally each. So, I want to go on to how to bootstrap. And there are a few things you need to know before you start. You can't just start bootstrapping any day. You actually have to do a little planning. You actually have to think about things ahead of time. And the first thing you've got to think about is you've got to line up sources of credit ahead of time. Really, really important to line up sources of credit. You know, if you've got a job, it's easy to borrow money. What do you think it's like if you don't have a job? If you say to the banker, well, I'm starting a company, will you lend me something? What are your chances of getting money? Not much. But if you've got a job, if you've got a house, if you, whatever, the banks love lending money nowadays. For some reason, because interest rates are you know, 4% or something like that, they love lending all sorts of money. So before you start, go into the bank, get yourself a line of credit. If you don't have 10 grand, 50 grand, whatever, most people are able to get a line of credit for something. Even if you're if you don't think now that you're going to need it, chances are you actually will need it. You're going to need a lot more money than you think you'll need. So even if you think you'll need 10,000, go in and get a line of credit for 25 just to play it safe in case you want to use that. First thing. Second thing, this is one of the advisors at Mars that I, I pictured here. It's Don Duval in, in costume, if you know Don. Um, you need to have uh, a chance to bounce things off of people, to get different ideas. If you know people in the industry or know people who are good advisors, use those people. If you don't, find your, come to Mars and find yourself someone that you can talk to at Mars. Uh, there are advisors at Mars. They are swamped with requests for advice, and I'm sure you've heard that before from people, that it's very difficult to get in and see them. But there are all sorts of people you can use. I went to see an advisor of mine today. You know, He doesn't know he's an advisor of mine, but um, he will if he watches this. He's a recruiter, and I, I wanted to, to get a sounding on what sort of person my next hire should be. So I went to him with a straw dog saying, you know, I could have just asked him, but I went through the whole scenario. This is what I'm thinking, and he, he, I've known him for many years, and he's act, acted as a recruiter for me before so in, in Cynamic. So, it was, you know, I, I've put a lot of money his way in hiring people. So it was no big, that's the type of person you want. Somebody who is out there in the industry who's going to give you the, the true bill of goods, who's not going to sugarcoat it. By the way, I just wanted to say, uh, he's an American hip-hop artist, not very Canadian. Next time, maybe Carnegie oh. Bishop. Oh. <laughs> Burn. Burn. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I didn't know he was American. I didn't know he was hip-hop. You know, I, I go and make these slides up. I go to the Google of images and go, something and that's what turns up so thank you you'll, you'll appreciate one of my f slides later on then um, so who is that by the way oh he is upstairs then um, yeah okay who don't you use as a mentor your mother okay <laughs> Your mother is probably the worst mentor you could ever have. And you might think, oh, you know, yeah, she gives me good advice. No. Okay? Your mother will never tell you that your idea stinks. You want to go to someone who will actually tell you, no, that's a stupid idea. Because, frankly, I've had more stupid ideas than I've had good ideas. And I really like it when somebody tells me I've got a stupid idea and why, because I go and change it and do something different with it. There's one guy I've, I've acted as a mentor for for know, five or six years now, and the first meeting that I had with him, I told him his business would never succeed, he was wasting his time at it, and he should not bother. 
And he said, well, that's different. Okay, I, I, I better listen. He kept at the business for another year and a half before it failed. But you know, from, from then on, he started developing another business, and that one is succeeding. You need a mentor who can say these things to you. You don't need someone like your mother or your friends. Part of the problem is that it's easy to yah-yah somebody. And yah yaing is when somebody, you ask somebody their opinion, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, good idea, good idea. A lot of people don't like saying no. They don't like the negative. It's a human behavior. They don't want to put out negative vibes or something like that. So they'll give you what you, they think you want to hear. Find a mentor who can actually tell you what you need to hear. Next thing is pick the right business. Now, that's been a particular bugaboo of mine for many, many years because uh, Cynamics was a really rough business to be in. And the bigger it got, the rougher it got. And it was really terrible because we sold uh, telecommunications equipment to telcos. And as we progressed, we got higher and higher up in the telco chain, and the dollars got bigger and bigger for each order. So at the point in time, we were, the typical order size was probably around a million bucks. The problem with that is you don't get many orders in a year at a million dollars. We weren't that big. So you go for a long period of time between orders, wondering, is there going to be another one or isn't there going to be another one? You create your funnel. You look at your analysis. You say, oh, yeah, there's going to be an order. These people are marching through the, the funnel, and, and it will work. But that sort of thing is very bad in a bootstrapping business. In a bootstrapping business, you, you've got to have the, the right type of business. You can't have a business that requires you to go out and build a hydroelectric generating station. It doesn't work. You've got to pick a business that is low capital, that is quick to get a response from the customer and get revenue, that is hopefully some sort of recurring revenue so that you don't have to keep getting money from people all the time. So it's a, it's a real style. This is why a lot of people go into online retail. They go into things that are, um, that are simple businesses. And when you look at the Inc. list of businesses started less than 10,000, there are a lot of personal services businesses. There are a lot of... Uh, retail or trading businesses, consulting businesses. Now, Arctic DX, um, Greg Hines, who's the founder of Arctic DX, wasn't in that film because he doesn't have nice glasses, as Jim does. I don't know if you notice Jim's glasses. He has a fetish for obscure eyewear. And uh, it, that was an interesting pair that I hadn't seen before, so it was nice to see it in, in video. It, that's actually pretty tame, and everybody's wondering, oh, I didn't notice his eyewear. I wonder what that was. They were purple circles. Did somebody notice that? They were from an American company, unfortunately. So, um, That's the sort of business you can't bootstrap. You can't bootstrap a business that requires a phenomenal amount of upfront uh, development work, a long time, multiple people. It's very difficult. If you've got deep pockets, you can do it. But in all probability, you're going to try and start a business for under 25 grand. And that's just not going to happen. So analyze carefully the type of business. And if you're starting a business, you, you know, you figure that it might take two or three businesses before you get it right. There's lots of statistics that shows that most people don't get it right on their first try. They don't get revenue, they don't get profits, they don't sell out, but they learn something and they go on to do it a second time and a third time. Uh, if you pick the right business, you can keep doing that. You can keep iterating. And there are all sorts of entrepreneurs out there, and I've, I've got one friend who about every five to 10 years, closes down one business and starts another one up. And I never get the story of why that one closed down, but obviously something failed and some other reason came up and he starts, starts another one. But they're businesses that are the right business. They're easy to start and do that with. So you've planned it all out. You're getting ready to get going. You've probably quit your job. Are there people here who are starting a business but fully employed elsewhere? Is there anybody here? That's tough, isn't it? It's really tough. You know, I debated trying that, but I said, I don't have the sort of energy that, that, that's needed to do that. I'm not going to do it. If you're getting going, you've probably quit something in order to do it. Oddly enough, when you look back at Wozniak and Jobs, Wozniak kept a, another full-time job that whole time. And I can't remember if Jobs did or not, but Wozniak was employed the whole time. Jobs was still in high school, I think. There he was. He was see, can you? So getting going. The first thing you've got to do is find the pain. And I don't know if you've heard that expression before in, in the marketing talks and things like that. 
really, really important that you go out there and talk to people. Now, uh, Carrie has a book, that I, th I think, on her desk called Rework. And if I'm not mistaken, that, it's the authors of that book that actually went out to interview 50 people before they started their business. I, I might Maybe. be... This is a, I just wanted to mention this book later. It's, um, it's kind of like Lean Startup, and it talks about bootstrapping, but more like bootstrapping beyond the money, like what it looks like in your team and with your products and staying lean and flexible and all these things. It's a great book, and it takes like an hour to read. It's like super small chapters. Carrie's a fast reader. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not like you. You're, you're yeah, really fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the key is don't think of an idea and go into your basement and start producing something. Go out and talk to people. Go talk to 50 people, find out what the real issue is, and then go back to your basement and do something. So in the business that I'm starting, I, I quit Mars a year ago. i um, gotten tired of watching other people be entrepreneurs and decided to go back doing it. Finally, I found something in which I had domain expertise, recurring revenue, and no VC, so that all worked. But the first thing I did is I went out talking to people. And I, I went out with the with a, a certain preposition. And the preposition was that management training is flawed. And one of the reasons that management training is flawed is that most of it is done live. There's little repetition. There's little, you, you don't learn by going to a classroom, you learn be new behaviors. Just like, anybody here lear learn to play soccer in a classroom? No, you can't learn to play soccer in a classroom. It, it doesn't work. You can't learn to manage in a classroom. You learn to manage uh, in a number of different ways, but I went out with the preposition that what, what was needed was some sort of reinforcement for lectures that, in management. What I found in talking to all sorts of people was, you know, while they had taken courses in management, none of them had ever learned from those management courses. They had learned how to manage by having a good manager that they could follow, by trying things out, and by talking to their peers. So I said, well, the whole the whole problem in management training is that you know, we're not recognizing that in the classroom setting. So I set out to develop a new process, but I went out, and the important part of that is not what I've created, it's the fact that I went out talking to all sorts of people and finding the pain. Now we'll see if that works in the long run, whether I've got it right, whether there's such a hidebound industry that they're unwilling to change their methodology. But those of you who are looking at education at all might have seen the Khan Institute. You heard of the Khan? Khan Academy, sorry. Khan Academy is incredible. I mean, a complete accident of someone who went out to train his niece and nephew how to do math problems. But he didn't live in the same city, so he created videos and put them on, the, on YouTube. And all of a sudden noticed that people around the world were watching his YouTube videos. And he's now getting to the point where he's changing the whole classroom paradigm, and he's working with school boards in order to take the lecture out of the classroom and put it at home, and take the homework out of home and put it in the classroom. He's switching the dynamic around in order to get people to learn. That's the type of thing you need to do to find the pain. You've got to get out there. You've got to try things. The next thing you've got to do is a simple business plan. Now, this is probably heresy. Have you heard from people here that you've got to write a business plan? No. You have heard that. Yeah, OK. Some of you can close your ears right now and hopefully not listen to this. I don't have a business plan. I have a whiteboard. And that is the sum total of my business plan. I'm working with another entrepreneur I met two years ago in the Upstart competition. I'm still working with him. He still hasn't written a business plan. He's doing very well. He's now profitable. Just became profitable in the last few months. He doesn't have a business plan. And the reason is that your business will change so dramatically in the first year, in the first two years, that writing more than four pages is a waste of time. You get some general idea of what you're going to try and do. And in fact, I found that I can put that general idea on a whiteboard. And the whiteboard lists all the things I have to do and what I'm trying to do, and, and, and it's a perfectly good plan. The great thing is that I can just go wipe it off and write something else in when that the thing doesn't work. So if you spend a lot of time, and people, you know, they're saying write a 50-page business plan, do all this analysis and stuff like that. Uh, no strategy, oh, what's the expression? No strategy uh, changed without encountering the enemy, or what's that? No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. There we go. And there are better people than here. I knew that one. I, do you want to say that again? I'll, I'll prefix it. I uh, say the planning, plans are worthless. Planning is what matters. No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. There you go. The customer is the enemy. 
Okay? Your objective is to take that customer's money. So don't spend your time writing plans to take the customer's money because it will change when you meet the customer. A very simple business plan is all you need. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. You can probably put it in one paragraph, just as simply as that. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Everybody should know that combination of things. Who are you going after? What are you going to try and sell them? Why are they going to want to buy from you? When are they going to want to buy? How are you going to make it? The thing, just look at those words, OK? The next thing you should do, so you've gone out, you found a little bit about the pain, you, you figured out what people are looking for, you have some idea of what the business is going to be, now go earn some other revenue. Go earn some consulting revenue. Now, if you're really good, you can make that revenue closely relate to what you're doing. If you're not, it really doesn't matter uh, what type of consulting revenue that you actually do earn. Just go and work for a day or two a week somewhere to give yourself some peace of mind that it is still possible to earn money. Otherwise, what happens is you watch month by month as your bank account goes lower and lower and lower. Now, this is something that you know, I've preached for years and I actually managed to do. I went out and got something that's paying me a day a week. It's enough that I get revenue coming in. And frankly, when you're starting a business, you try and live frugally. So you know, I'm trying to live a little more frugally than I have in the past. Uh, so you go and get that consulting. Mine sort of lines up with what I'm doing, but it doesn't totally. It's in an allied field, another subject. You can earn better money as a consultant on a per hour basis than you can a full-time job. So in a day a week, you might be able to earn half of what you earned before, maybe a third of what you earned before. So it is something coming in the door, little expenses, little thing like that. And while you're doing that, spend the rest of your time building something. Now, some of you, if you're starting a services business, you, you can skip the start building your product. Some of you might need some core of a product before you uh, get out seeing customers. I'm in a case where I need a core product to be able to talk about. I can't go to a customer with a nebulous idea and say, what do you think about this, except that I've gone and found the, what I think is the pain. I can't go out and say, what do you think of that? And they'll say, show me. So I, I have spent the last eight months building a product uh, using digital media and software and things like that in order to have something where I'm now reaching the point of time where I can actually go and start earning some revenue on that product. So start building your product while you're earning your consulting revenue otherwise. So you've gotten to the point, let's say you've you found out what the pain is, you're earning some money, you're, you're building a product little bit by little bit, the product's not complete. The key is get it somewhere so you can get some reaction. Use the 80-20 rule. Produce, uh, um, you know, 80% of the product takes 20% of the effort. Use that to your benefit. Don't have all of the bells and whistles. Don't have all of the features. Don't get, you know, this absolutely perfect product. Don't wait for that point in time. Wait for a point in time where you can actually get some, uh, some feedback. You know, I talked to one, uh, is Carrie Golden talking here at all this year? Not this year. Okay. So Kerry Golden is someone who was with Mars, serial entrepreneur. She's at another company. And I was talking to her, and she's, we were talking about bugs. You know, in the software industry, people expect bugs, and they really expect them out of new products, and they're willing to really be patient. At Synamics, we had one very, very patient customer, and that was Bell Mobility. And, okay, they're not patient anymore, obviously, but they were patient then. We were doing things in the network that no one in the world had ever done before, so they were quite willing to have us make mistakes for a while to see what we were doing. But the key is to start this thing out, you need to leverage relationships. You need to use who you know to find out some way to get into something. Don't expect that you're going to be able to go cold calling and find a good relationship. You need to find some sort of leverage uh, into a situation. Microsoft is the best example of leverage that the world has ever seen. Uh, another bootstrap company, of course. But uh, do you know how Microsoft got successful? IBM. How did they get to IBM? Nope. Absolutely. Gates's mother was on the board, a charity board with someone senior at IBM. And Gates, at that point in time, was building a basic compiler, for those of you who are in, in the business. That's all he did. He didn't have an operating system. But his conversation with the IBM person who said, you know, we're building a personal computer, we're looking for an operating system. Gates 
being slightly ballsy, said, oh, I, can, I have an operating system for you. Of course, he didn't have an operating system. That's another great thing about when you're selling vaporware, is just claim you do and then figure out how to do it later. <laughs> That's what Gates did. He went out, and for $50,000, he bought the rights to DOS, Disk Operating System, from someone without royalty. And because of that, for $50,000, he sold to IBM. Now, he didn't sell for $65,000. He sold at X dollars a computer. Very smart businessman. Okay? That was the foundation. He leveraged a relationship entirely in order to get into a place. That's how you will find your first customers. That's how you will find your first deals. Somebody who you know. Everybody here must be on LinkedIn. It's really quite marvelous the number of people you can find on LinkedIn. And if, if you even don't know, if you can find the person and you find somebody else in their company, you can guess what their email address is. So there are all sorts of ways of getting in and doing things that can leverage relationships. The next thing is, you've got to find the fox, okay? I get in trouble for this slide. The, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the fox is the person in the organization who is going to be your champion. So when you go into an organization, and it is a common expression in sales, find the fox. You need to find the person in your target company, and that's where you leverage a relationship. You use a relationship, and they might get you into the wrong person, but you use that person to find the fox. Within the company, there is somebody who's doing something innovative. In Bell Mobility, which I mentioned before, it was Eros Spadato. And you can look him up. He's quite senior in the telecom industry now. He was the fox in Bell Mobility. And finding him was what people needed to do, because he was willing to, to take risks and to make decisions to to acquire things from entrepreneurs that other people in the organization weren't willing to make. The fox is someone who's going to champion you, who's going to take you into that organization, who's going to protect you when you screw up, because you will screw up, I guarantee it, who's going to be your mentor within the organization, and who's going to provide so much information that you'll be amazed. Now, on the other hand, you've probably listened to John Warren talk about um, crossing the chasm and the fact that the early innovator buys for a different reason than the late innovator, that is the case. The fox is probably the early innovator, the, 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 not even the early adapt, adopter, but the earliest innovator you can find. But that person is going to be critical to finding that, finding that person, finding that fox in the organization is going to be critical. Next thing you want to do is look for service opportunities. If you go in and, you know, um, Software is a particularly good industry to do that, and unfortunately, I don't understand anything complex about the people here in, in medical sciences and physical sciences and things like that. Software is for people who are fundamentally dumb but like technology, which is why I'm in software. I don't have the brains to become a doctor or anything like that. So service opportunities abound. You can go in, and if a company really needs something, they'll pay for you to develop it from scratch. That's when you know you really have a great opportunity. That was particularly true in the 80s and 90s when people were desperate for new software products. But it still exists nowadays. If you go in with a core, look for service opportunities aligned with that core product that you can develop and earn revenue from. Because the next thing you want to do is, well, actually not the next thing. You, you want that service opportunity because having the service enables you to continue building the product and have somebody pay for it. So if you've got services revenue, and that's what we did at Synamics, because uh, for a long period of time, we, we lived on our own devices. We made money. We were profitable, things like that. But we'd go into a company, and we'd sell them our core, and we'd provide a, an application with it, and we'd use some of the money that they paid for the application, we priced them this way, to actually add to the core product. So over time, every time we did something for a customer, on a service opportunity, it added to the core product. It was another feature or another bit of code. It just it built itself from revenue from the client. The client is your best investor. And the client invests through service opportunities. So while you're not getting VC money, you're getting client money from those services as an investor. Make sure you're solving a problem for them. Make sure that, uh, that you're not just dealing with some peripheral matter that you're actually solving a real live problem for the client. The type of problem you want is, you know, you've heard people say low-hanging fruit. 
it's unfortunately a misused um, expression because it's very, you know, everybody says, oh, there must be low-hanging fruit, we're going to go after the low-hanging fruit, things like that. It's very hard to find the low-hanging fruit. But the way you've got to look at a business is there are types of opportunities that are really low-hanging fruit. And a, and a business, low-hanging fruit is their number one priority. So if you think of, I want to find what their number one priority is, what they need to change, what's part of their business plan as a number one priority, then you found low-hanging fruit. And the key to um, low-hanging fruit is that if you're solving a regulatory need for them, somebody said you must have this by such and such a date, then you've got low-hanging fruit. So the first order of low-hanging fruit is regulatory. The second order is strategic. So it's strategic if you can enable them to have a product that helps them defeat their competitors, that's strategic. They will probably buy that before they buy other things. The next is solving an operational problem for them. We're getting lower down on the order of what low-hanging fruit is. And finally, there's a financial problem. I'm going in to save them money. You sort of, you go into a client and you say, well, you know, I can save you, you know, a million dollars a year and it's going to cost you half a million. And you wonder, why wouldn't they do that? It makes logical sense, doesn't it? Well, the problem is saving money is a low-order problem. They have so many things that are regulatory and strategic and operational that they've got to get through that they don't have the manpower or the time to look at things that just save them money. So it's not low-hanging fruit. You've got to find the problem that is the low-hanging fruit. If you're doing that, you can then land a sale. So landing the sale is very difficult in the first few times because you need credibility to land that sale. Very difficult. High degree of risk, a long time period. The more credibility you have, the better chance you have of landing a sale. So how do you gain credibility? What do you do? Prove that it works. How do you do that? Free trials. Do free trials. Do something for them that's, that's free in order to get in the door to prove that it actually works. If you can, tie that to a future order. If you can say, you know, uh, if, it, you know if it succeeds, you pay me $50,000 or whatever it is, or if you like it, pay me. When, uh, when Jobs went in to sell the first computers, he actually showed them a computer. It was working. He made a sale because the computer was working. If he didn't have a computer that was working, he wouldn't have made a sale. And so the person could actually try it out, test it. That gains you credibility. Credibility also comes from the fox, not Megan Fox. It, it comes from your relationships that you'd leveraged because you know, people don't just send chumps in. They send people usually that have something worthwhile to do. Uh, so you want to leverage that relationship for credibility. Past sales, why do you think everyone uses references? References are key to credibility in sales. Now, meeting competitors head on is really quite interesting because everybody's got competitors. And the, the story Carrie Golden tells is of how, in her last company, she uh, went to the first uh, trade show and found two or three other companies that she didn't know existed were all of a sudden there. All four of them ended up at the first trade show for the first time at the same time. And that will happen. You'll be developing something new. You won't know that other people are developing it at the same time because they're sort of under the radar. And everybody's under the radar until some point in time when everybody's above the radar. So you've got those competitors to deal with. You also have the big entrenched competitors. You really have to, in order to get the entrenched competitors, offer some really, really keen value proposition. Something that's significantly different that makes people sit up and say, no, my big competitor won't be able to do that. It, and there are three ways that people differentiate themselves in the market. There are only three ways. That's quality, cost, and speed. So you've got to find some way to differentiate yourself on one of those bases, either getting it in there faster than anybody else, or uh, costing a lot less, or having the highest quality. You might have heard of the blue ocean strategy. Blue ocean strategy meaning more quality at much lower cost, or way more quality, much lower cost, that combination is, is unassailable from a competitive position. It's what Henry Ford did. As you're working, you're getting some revenue now. You still might have your consulting gig. You still might be earning some uh, services revenue. 
but now you're starting to get revenue and the revenue is building and building as time goes on. You'd be surprised how long that takes. You know, you, you might start out thinking, okay, I'll be earning revenue in six months or a year or something like that. But the, the individual I worked with who was in the upstart competition, it was three years before he was earning revenue. And he didn't realize that when he started. If he'd known when he started, he wouldn't have started. That's why you get the graphs of those companies and how long it took to reach 50 million. In the States, and I'll give you the Canadian statistics in a second, the, uh, the average successful company takes six years to get to 10 million. And their first, ugh, you might think, well, I've got, I've got revenue forecasts that are telling me I'm going to get to 10 million in January next year. Not going to happen. Okay, not going to happen. It takes six years for the most successful companies in the States to reach 10 million. In Canada, it takes 10 years. That's because we suck at sales and marketing. I'm, it's true. So get some revenue. The next thing you want to do while you're doing it, keep your overhead low. I'm still working in my den. I love it. Sun shines in the window. In the middle of the day, I decide to go out for a run. It's a marvelous way to work. Find a way to keep your overhead extremely low. Important in that is keeping your costs variable. Low fixed costs. Don't have expensive rent. Find ways of paying for things with results. Pay people with results. Pay for uh, product if you get a sale. That type of thing. Keep your costs lined up with your revenue. So as you're growing, your costs grow with your revenue. And that's another part of being in the right business. Don't be in a business where it takes millions of dollars to get going and then the costs are low after. It's little bits to get going and you're paying as time is, as money goes on. The great thing about the software industry now, if you're hosting stuff, you can buy you know, slices of, ho of hosted applications for very little. And as your business grows, you can get more and more space on those same um, outsourced computers. You don't need to go and buy the computers anymore. You're, you're buying time on them. Find employees who'll share the risk. I'm actually debating now what to go. I told you I was talking to my recruiter today, going out debating what uh, I'm going to get. And I want somebody who's going to share the risk. I want somebody who is, has, has got enough gumption to know that they're going to do well in the long run, doing better in the long run from sharing the risk from not. You don't want to be hiring people when you're starting, your first couple of people, you don't want at high salaries. That's high fixed cost. It's not high variable cost. You want to keep them as variable in their costs as possible by finding people who share the risks with you on an ongoing basis. You want to leverage suppliers, just the way Jobs did. He sold, his, um, he sold the suppliers on the concept of, I've got a purchase order. I'm going to go out and get money and pay you um, in the end. Now, there are programs in Canada that actually do that for you. Export Development Corp can line you up if you're doing exporting of major things where they'll finance um, receivables and with purchase orders, you can, other organizations will finance purchase orders. Harder in the small startup, but uh, look for things where you can leverage your suppliers, where you can get free trials for them, when you, when you get discounts to start with. They want to develop business as much as you do. And finding a next great thing is really good for them. So see what you can do there. And as you're going, as you do this, you're building your product. And it, it might take you years to get to a finished product. It might take forever to get there. But little bit by little bit, you're building a product. Figure out your business model. As you're doing this, figure out how you're making your money, what your costs are, what, it's, what is necessary to earn a profit. Because you're reiterating this process time and time again, it gives you a chance to figure out how you're going to make money at this. Because you, know, you might say in your business plan, if you've written a 50-page business plan, this is our business model, and it, you know, that's not going to survive encounter with the enemy or whatever that is. I have to really learn that expression. But if you're changing your business plan as you go along and you're changing your business model as you go along, you're learning about it, you're building it, you're getting more and more successful at it. And you do that again and again and again. And you know, the how often you do it depends on what your sales cycle is. But if you've got a several month sales cycle, you're actually able to iterate this process 
time and time again over several months. If you're in a business which is uh, online marketing, you might be able to iterate your sales process multiple times in the matter of weeks. Has anybody read The 4-Hour Workweek? Great book. If you've got a chance, read The 4-Hour Workweek because it talks about a guy who went out and uh, uh, he wanted to have a business selling, I can't, I can't remember what it was, shirts. Where's my institutional memory? There must be somebody on here. And he, uh, so what he did is he put an ad up. He didn't have any shirts to sell, but he put an ad up to see what the results would be. And he got the orders and then at the last minute in, in, before accepting payment, he negated the order. He just stopped the order you know, in the midst. But he was able to try it with umpteen different products to find out what the best combination was of, um, uh, of ad and price and product placement and things like that. A friend of mine in England did this scratch card business where you put scratch cards in the, in the newspaper and, you know, you scratch them off and you phone a 1-900 number. You don't remember those things probably. In England, they're very popular. They're, they're pay-per-call numbers in order to get a prize. Well, he tried and he tried and tried again. And for him, the cycle was several weeks because he'd build a new, he'd build a new concept and he'd try it out in a few newspapers and build another one. He experimented with that, basically experimenting with his business model for uh, several years before he got it perfect. He was making money the whole time and every time he did it, he made a bit more and a bit more until finally he had a really enormous money-making opportunity. And he sold out of that for millions and millions of pounds just because he'd taken the time to reiterate doing it again and again and again. And then what? You're doing it again and again. You're going through this process. It's a long process. Once you have products, reference accounts, a working business model, the right people, and exponential growth, you should go out and raise money to fuel that growth. If you don't have exponential growth, don't bother raising money. You can finance it yourself in all probability. And if you look back at the most successful startups, you might not realize it, but that's what they did. If you go back to Jobs and Wozniak, they had the Apple One. They were selling it in a number of stores. They were actually making money, and they were able to leverage suppliers. They had a whole bunch of good people, and they were starting to experience exponential growth before they went and raised money. That's the same thing that RIM did. The big companies, you look at these companies and you say, you know, what was success and what wasn't success? Behind it is this formula. It's not VC. The formula is built upon continually reiterating the process of bootstrapping until you get it all right, and then you can go raise money. Are there any questions? We have uh, the first question from the webcast. Um, it's a question about talking about sort of how do you bootstrap with consulting or services. How does one, it's coming from Jufran, how does one who may not have a degree or any consulting experience get into consulting or offering services? Well, uh, consulting could be working in a bar. There's no reason, you, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good money working in a bar. Uh, you can wait tables. You, so, you know, I shouldn't have used the word consulting. Get some gig that doesn't interfere with building a business while you're doing it. And uh, if that can be consulting at, at $100, $200 an hour, that's great. If it's uh, waiting tables, you know, that's great too. When you started um, Synamics, you were doing selling services. So what kind, so... Don't forget I did that all wrong. Did you? Yeah, but you offered, so while you were building the technology, you were consulting as, like, offering services to solve people's problems, which is what consulting is, is find out what the bleeding neck wound, wound is and well, solve the, it. I did consulting at the same time as I was starting for the first year and then started selling services within Synamics. Question from the floor? Hi. Uh, I'd like to know what your pros and cons are of two different things, one of which is uh, government sources, uh, be they investment uh, initiatives or things like that, and the other is crowdsourcing things like uh, Kickstarter.com and so on. Crowdsourcing uh, money? Sorry? Crowdsourcing money? Yes. Um, first of all, government programs, if you can get it, that's great. There are some really good government programs out there that have no strings attached money and that are, you know, I hate to say it's possible to game the system, but you really can. Uh, they're, the, the Mars and various companies like that actually provide all sorts of programs 
that provide you ten, twenty thousand dollars, and those are great pieces of money to get if you can. The best thing is you never have to pay it back, and you don't have to give up equity. The 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 uh, little bits of money from those things, I've read about those programs. I've never looked in enough depth to see whether it's worthwhile. Um, so, so you mentioned how v VC and raising money from VCs is not the most efficient thing can do. What about um, incubators, things like Mars here or Y Combinator or Techstars, something like that? They're faster. They're much faster, mm -hmm. but they're still going to take you time. Things like Y Combinator are great because you can go in there and work on a product and while you're working on it, be supported and, uh, and then get money in the end if it's successful. So that's the type of model that actually feeds this perfectly because you're not actually trying to raise money. You're part of Y Combinator to do it. Um, what, are, what are some of the other ones you mentioned? There's Techstars, um, there's Digital Media Zone in, in Ryerson. A Digital Media Zone doesn't have any money associated with it. It's uh -huh. more like a space you can go and operate. Uh -huh. um, so, so basically, you're, you're saying that they, if we lose efficiency because we focus time on raising money rather than building product. Yeah. So if anything helps building the product. Then anything helps. Y Combinator helps building the product. That's yes. a really good yes. program. Okay. Thank you. Why? <laughs> Combinator. Like why is in yellow? Why? 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 Com Combinator. 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 There's also a, a, an accelerator called Extreme Startups in Toronto that does, it's like Y Combinator. Mm -hmm. It puts in equity and has a space and has mentors that work with companies. Um, another question from the webcast is, you, um, Charles, you talked about hiring people who share the risk with you. Um, how you can, can you elaborate on different techniques on how you, how you do that? I think you're hiring a, a salesperson right now mm -hmm. and you've sort of developed a value proposition. Um, and part of that is sharing the risk. So rewards later. first thing you have to do is con them into the glorious future that you all hold mm -hmm. together. And you're going to have to do a lot of that over the mm -hmm. next little while if you're starting a business because everyone needs to be uh, conned into, because you don't know what's going to happen with this thing and the, I mean, the percentage likelihood is, is small. Um, the, the way to get people interested is, number one, you, you've got to find people probably who aren't uh, in the stage where they've got kids who are really expensive. And it's a sad thing to say, I started uh, my first business before I had kids. I'm starting this one after the kids have left. So it's very nice. I don't have kids anymore that cost me money. So the, in between that time, the people you get are very important. So you have to look for a particular po type of person. You have to give up equity in order to get them. You have to share. If you're sharing the risks, you've got to share the rewards. And that's another key to it. And, and it's hard frequently to come to um, the right decision as to how much you share. And for that, you might use your mentors to figure that out. But if you're the founder and you've worked on it longer, you know, use those factors to say, but you've got to give up equity. Mm -hmm. Also create a job where the person ha has great potential career experience from the job. It might mean that they're part-time when they only want to be part-time and they can't get a part-time job. Or it might mean that you're getting someone much more junior than you would otherwise get because you're giving them a phenomenal opportunity. Um, I think I was just ta talking to someone who's doing marketing for a startup that has about 130 people and she's the only person doing marketing and she, they got her right out of school and the opportunity is fantastic for her because she does everything. She learns and creates everything. So, so if you find that kind of person that's really excited about the potential to do everything rather than go into a big company and do the same thing over and over again. There are people that want to do that. Okay, that. okay, that was sort of my question, so I thought maybe I'll ask you something a bit more uh, deeper on it. So, when uh, bringing on potential collaborators uh, who are essential, I'm wondering uh, how do you normally approach that discussion on how much equity you'll share? how much you won't, or also approach things in terms of maybe future return and a commission uh, scheme. If there's a product, uh, you could look at sharing the, the product income, but not the company equity. Um, are, are there a couple common negotiating tactics that you find are useful? Well, well the first negotiating tactic is never start the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they want first. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's really unfair, because as an employer, you're in the power position. And um, usually if you're in an employment situation and you're trying to hire an employee, you should tell them what the salary is first. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, what you want to find out is what their needs are. 
you might not know what their needs really are. And I had a, a great case where um, I employed someone who uh, came from Yugoslavia. And we were his first job after coming from Yugoslavia. This is from Belgrade in the years of the great diaspora of, of talent that came out of that country. And uh, he, phenomenally bright programmer. You give him something to do, you give him six weeks, he'd do nothing but nothing for five weeks. At the very end, he'd wake up, he'd do it all, and he was done. And perfect code, and it took him six weeks. Didn't do anything for five. And I kept trying to figure out, how do I get this guy to you know, do this for six weeks? What I found is he couldn't care about money because he'd been in Belgrade. And you know, he, he'd learned to live with getting bags of salt in payment for his work. So money didn't mean much. He was getting a lot of money already. Uh, what meant most to him was the chance to win a prize. Hmm. He loved collecting little prizes on, in his cubicle of things. Uh, so we created prizes for people, which he would immediately try and aim for, and usually win, and work twice as hard just to win a stupid prize. So my, <laughs> his name is Zoran Duma. He now runs a company in the telecommunications field. Um, and he probably is still exactly the same way, and he probably just cares about little prizes still. The key is, <laughs> You've got to find out what their needs are, yeah. because in all likelihood, you will not guess what their needs are. Mm -hmm. It might be freedom and creativity. It might be a huge title. They always wanted, always wanted to be a vice president. Well, that's cheap. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> you can be president if you like. I'll tell anybody who wants to join me. You can be CEO. I don't care. I've been CEO for too long in my life. So, I I was reading a book on uh, called Carrot Principle yes, yesterday, which is on motivation. And it says in a, in a big study, the thing that motivates people most is, I forget the first one, I'll think of it in a sec, but number two, no, first is growth. So contributing something, feel like they're getting better. Number two is recognition. Three was pay. And four was a good relationship with their boss or manager, which I thought was really interesting. Or work with somebody who's dry and dense. <laughs> Charles is looking for a sales professional yeah. if anybody's interested. Yeah. Somebody will take risk. Exactly. Hi. Um, I'm actually a founder of a mobile startup uh, yep. known as Public Leaf. I've been doing, doing bootstrapping for the past two years right now. And I found that it actually hinders social innovation. So that's what we do actually in the company. And we need funding so you know, to actually do the social innovation that we actually do at our work. So I don't know what your thoughts about that more money, more innovation, or less money, less innovation? So what do you think about that? Social innovation is really hard to raise money for because the traditional financial investors don't trust social innovators. It's a very they want area. they All they care about, this is where you get down to why you don't want a VC as a partner. They don't share your social innovation desire. Someone like Paul Martin, and he has a fund that actually shares, you know, he, he is a social innovator. So. That there are specialty social innovators that will invest in uh, social results. England, there's a phenomenal system that's developed there, mm -hmm. but in Canada, that's very difficult to find. That's what I'm trying to find out. It's it's difficult over here for some reason. But so, my what I would say to you is, shut up about the social part, <laughs> and, say innovation. and talk about the innovation part, <laughs> and talk about the returns, and very quietly, do your social thing. You don't have to tell everybody all the truth. <laughs> Good idea. Thank you. I think, I think Char Charles used to get in trouble at Mars because of his strong views on social innovation. He, because he thinks that all businesses are social innovators because when you create jobs, you help the economy. So he, he, he might skew a little bit farther away from some of the people that like to talk about social innovation. Yeah, what, what you've heard tonight is worth exactly what you've paid for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to take one more question. Thank you guys for being patient and letting us run over time a little bit. I just want to make two announcements for the last question. There was a, a question on shareholder partnership agreements and shareholder agreements. It's not publicized yet, but we have an upcoming best practices May 8th on that. We're going to get people to talk about the soft side of partnerships and the hard stuff, the legal stuff. So I know that's, uh, that'll be very valuable. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Charles is an amazing manager and uh, there is an upcoming best practices April 26th from 12 to 1.30 on seven things you need to know about management. As you can tell, he really, he really talks about things like they are, so you'll get lots of valuable insights. Promise to be a great session. And last question. Oh, hi, Charles. I have a question about the fox and the mentor. 
So between the fox and the mentor, I want to find both. And how do I differentiate between the two to make sure that I'm using this person as the mentor and this is the right person as the fox? What are the criteria? First of all, the fox is, works inside the company to which you wish to sell. The mentor works outside. So the mentor is not a potential buyer. Uh, it, it's, you can get mentorship from a fox, but in all likelihood, the fox has a particular agenda. And so you don't want to taint what you're doing with the fox's agenda. And that's part of the problem in the beginning. You might get people who are steering you in one direction when you should be going another way. Separate the two. Inside is target and outside. So, okay, now he's company A that I'm talking. How can I tell that this person is really the fox rather than someone who's leading me down the wrong path? Oh, that's difficult. But, um, yeah, you get yeah yeah as much by people as you, outside people as you do by your mother. The, the, you know, the, the fox is somebody who will sign a check. Somebody who will actually produce a purchase order. So if you go for a, if you ask for an order, yes. and you don't get it, you're getting yayad. But still, how can I know that this person is giving me the white right hints to guide me to the white right direction, so that finally this guy or this woman will sign the check? You need you need many of them. You need multiple foxes. In so, multi so you need ten companies with foxes in them, and you might get lucky and get sales with two or three of them. And within each company, do I try to what? Get one fox? Or one fox per company, 10 companies. At the same time? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Or 20 companies, or 50 yeah. companies. Multiple target, one fox per company. Multiple target, one fox. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Thanks so much, Charles. That was fantastic. Thank you.